So every Rosh Hashanah morning, the same Torah passage is read. If we were having two days of Rosh Hashanah, it would be the section before this today and then this section on day two. Since we have one day together, we read the Akedah, the story, the story of the binding of Isaac, which for many, as we were growing up, seemed to be the most problematic passage in the entire Torah. The notion that there would be a God in heaven who would test a parent by asking that parent to take a beloved child to a mountain and sacrifice him as a test of the parent's love for God. And if one reads the simple Pishat text, it can be troubling. I had a, an argument, no, a disagreement with a, um, a Jew who reads the Torah much more literally than midrashically. And this, a wonderful writer in the Jewish world, we were talking about the Akedah, And there, it, it always surprises me that there are in the Jewish world individuals who read the Torah as if it's a newspaper account, as if it is a literal description of what happened at a given point in time, as opposed to the way in which the Jewish tradition teaches us in a very subtle way to read the Torah. The master at teaching us how to read the Torah is Maimonides. Maimonides was the greatest Jewish philosopher in the history of time. He was also the greatest halachist, the greatest legal scholar. And in a book entitled The Guide to the Perplexed, Maimonides begins by explaining that the words in the Torah are a mashal. The best way to describe, to translate mashal is a metaphor. That when it says God sits on a kisei throne, it doesn't really mean there's a throne in heaven. And when it talks about God having an arm, or a mouth, or a face, or a back, it's all mashal. And I want to be fair. I probably extend mashal more than Maimonides would. But the principle is exactly the same. The principle is when we read Torah, we are not reading it as if it's a history book or a newspaper account. It's an extraordinary text that's to touch our heart and show us how we want to live as human beings in a painful, confusing, marvelous world. And that's how the Akedah must be read. It cannot be read as if there is a real God in heaven who one day said to a real father, Avraham, Avraham, Take your son to a mountain I'm going to show you and sacrifice him as a test. And if it's not a literal account, if it's not a newspaper account, then the question is, what's the story all about? And I have two things to sort of say. I, I want to say two things about the story on this Rosh Hashanah. The first is a reminder of what the story really is in its time if we were living some 3,000 years ago. Actually, Abraham is roughly 2,000 BCE, so it would be 4,000 years ago. And when Abraham lived, there was a common practice. It comes back to this notion of Pidyon Haben. It comes back to the notion of their the parents give up the first fruits of everything, including 
their children. And there was prevalent, at the time of Abraham, child sacrifice. It was commonplace. It was the way of the world. And the story of the Akedah is this radical, courageous stand that said to its own time, no, there is no God in heaven who ultimately wants a parent to sacrifice a child. The whole point of the Akedah, and I say the whole point, every verse of the Akedah is rich with Midrashic interpretation. But the bottom line of the Torah is that in the end of the story, the angel of Adonai comes to Abraham and says, stay not there, stop it. You don't have to go through with it. And then God, God's self comes and says, do not sacrifice your son. <coughs> and we should imagine what would it be like if we lived at a time when it was taken for granted that one sacrificed one's firstborn son. And all of a sudden, there's a story where God says, don't do it. And that the way in which we indicate fidelity to an ideal, to a vision of what we want for a just, kind world does not include child sacrifice. And the story is a powerful story of a family. And in a different context, it would be, it's fun to look at the dynamic between Sarah and Isaac between Sarah and Abraham, between Abraham and Isaac. And in the Midrash, the Jewish reading of this story, the hero of the story is not Abraham. The hero of the story is Isaac. When I was young, I always imagined Isaac was like a bar mitzvah kid. And his father said, let's go. What's a bar mitzvah kid do? He goes. And then one understands that in the Jewish tradition, Abraham tells his adult son, an adult son, 30s, 40s, they're going to go on this journey to Moriah. And if you're, if you're 30 or you're 40, this is, you know exactly what's going to happen. You know why you're going. And Isaac went with his father because Isaac believed in his father. But they were doing this together. And the theme, it's almost a refrain in the story is that both of them went together. But by going together, they ultimately changed forever the perspective of child sacrifice. And when we read the Akedah, it has to be read in that context, that it is a dramatic story leading up to a climax where child sacrifice is forever rejected. And of course, in the Jewish tradition, it is an impossible thought. That's one thing I would suggest we be thinking of when we hear the Akedah read in just a moment. Then there's something else that relates to this year's theme. If you weren't here for last night, the whole idea of this year is that when we say Shana to someone, it's not a greeting. It's really a prayer. It's a prayer that they should have blessing, that blessings should come to every one of us, all we love. And that's what we really mean when we say Shana Tova. 
and that we all know what it is to be living in a world where there's blessing. But in the Torah, it is not only that we want blessings for ourselves, but at one point, Abraham is blessed by God with a charge, with a command. In the Torah, God says to Abraham, you will be a blessing. And that becomes Abraham's responsibility. And from the Jewish tradition's perspective, it becomes our responsibility. The Jewish people, every Jew has a responsibility not only to hope for blessings for others, but to be a blessing to others, to create a soft, gentle life where people know they're cared for and embraced and they're not left alone and they're not left frightened and their dreams become our dreams and we do everything we can to fulfill their dreams and to help them become what they want to be, and by doing that, we are a blessing ourselves. We become the blessing. The charge is to be a blessing. But we're only people. And as much as we want to do that, life gets in the way. And when life gets in the way, sometimes opportunities slip through our fingers. We have plans wonderful plans to do something lovely for somebody else. And then the rush of life, running here, running there, caring for children, caring for parents, caring for people we love who are ill. The next thing you know, the day goes by and the opportunity slips by as well. And a blessing that we could have brought to somebody, we miss it. And so the Jewish tradition says to us, look for blessings. In the Jewish tradition, you know, a Jew is supposed to say 100 blessings every day. And that's not, again, it's not literal. It is poetic. The idea is we are to look for opportunities to say, isn't life wonderful and how wonderful it is, the goodness that we have, and... What a wonderful opportunity we have to be a blessing for others. So that was the basic theme last night. And then in the, in the Midrash, there's a connection between the word well in Hebrew, which is bur, and the word bracha. So that the rabbis do a drash that ultimately bur is in the bracha. And what they do is, say that the symbol of blessing is the well, the water. That water, the primordial source of life. And we talked about how water plays such a big role in the Torah. But that water is ultimately the ultimate symbol of blessing. And so how we concretize it in a symbol this year is with water. And we talked about the story of the well and how so many people in the Torah meet at a well. Jacob meets Rachel at a well. Moses meets Zipporah at a well. And there's, there's the iconic story of Rebekah where Abraham sends his servant Eliezer to the well to find somebody special for his wife, for her, his son Isaac to marry. And Eliezer goes and waits. And at the well, he waits for someone to come who will say to him, stranger, I see you need water. I will give you water. I will give your camels water before I give it to myself. And Rebecca is the one who exudes kindness and blessing for she comes to the well, sees the stranger and says to the stranger, oh, Drink from my pitcher first, and let me give to your camels first, and then I will take for myself. And Eliezer knows this is the one I was sent to find, someone who exudes goodness and kindness and brings blessings to others. 
And so the symbol is an attempt to hint at the jug that Rebecca might have been carrying from which she poured the water. And it is the water in the pitcher that is a constant reminder to us. It's so simple. It's pure. It's clean. It's simple. It reminds us it's so simple to find a way to bring blessing to people we love, to the members of our family, and to our friends and our community. It is so, but it is, it is refreshing. It is the source of life. And that's why the symbol is what it is this year. And the Akedah adds the symbol in the closing Midrash. I remind you of Midrash, hopefully you know very, very well. In the end, in the Midrash, the rabbis create a story that turns the Akedah on its head. Because at the end of the story, when the angel comes to Abraham in the text and says to Abraham, do not stretch forth the knife. Do not sacrifice your son. In the Midrash, God, in the Midrash, Abraham turns to the angel and says, if God wants me to stop this sacrifice, you tell God to get God's self over here and tell me God's self. God told me to, if God wants me to stop, God will tell me not to. And in the Midrash, there's a suggestion God sends the angel because God is embarrassed, he's ashamed. He can't, he can't even face Abraham. But when God is called, God always comes. So in the Midrash, God comes. And Abraham says to God, so you came. God says, yes. And you want to tell me what? And God says, stay your hand. Do not slay your son. And Abraham says, no, I will not stay my hand. Because you, God, broke a promise to me. You promised that if I left my homeland and my family and traveled to a new land I knew not where it would be, that you would make me into a great nation. Didn't you promise that to me, God? And God says, yes. And Abraham says, and didn't you promise that I would become a great nation through my son, Isaac? And God says, yes, I made that promise. And Abraham says to God, and then you tell me to bring Isaac to this mountain and to kill him? And God says, yes, I did. And Abraham says to God, you broke your promise to me. And Abraham says, yes, I'm sorry, and God says, yes, I did. In the Midrash, God, Abraham says, okay, I won't sacrifice my son Instead, I will forgive you. God says, thank you. Abraham continues, on one condition. God says, what's the condition? And Abraham says, each year, the children of Israel, the children of men, Jew and non-Jew, men and women will stand in front of you having broken their promises. As I forgive you today, you will forgive the children of men and women every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur just as I have forgiven you. And God says, it's a deal. 
from now on on every holidays, I will no longer be the God of justice. I will be the God of mercy. And I will forgive everyone for their trespasses, for their failures, for their broken promises, just as you have forgiven me today. And then he says, take the ram's horn, blow the ram. Have Ken and Brian blow the ram's horn every Rosh Hashanah morning. Blow the shofar, and I will hear the shofar, and I will remember my promise to you to forgive on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. There is a very powerful lesson there for us as it applies to blessing. One of the most loving blessings one can give another is the blessing of forgiveness. So often, inside families and between good friends, there becomes anger and resentment and estrangement and distance. For all sorts of, somebody said something that hurt. It's interesting. We all know it's very painful to have a physical injury. Even a very teeny tiny injury can be very painful. If you get a certain kind of splinter in your finger, it's horrible. You get something in your eye. You can't wait to get this out of your eye let alone you fall down, you break an arm, you break a leg, you break a hip. Hips are big. Very painful. But it's amazing how painful emotional pain can be. It's amazing how painful the experience of being belittled is or neglected is, or ignored is. Not being included. Ridiculed, made fun of. Let alone the pain of a feeling that somebody who once loved you doesn't love you anymore. That pain is excruciating. And sometimes husbands and wives, they're off for a moment. And life just isn't right at all until things get back to the way they were. Children and parents. It can get out of whack. And it makes everybody so uncomfortable. And then we know what it is when it comes back into focus. Friends who really care for each other. Somehow something is said, something is done. Very often it's a misunderstanding. It doesn't matter. A hurt is a hurt. And then one carries it with one. And sometimes it's the person doesn't even mean to do it, doesn't want to do it. It's, it's even possible somebody, somebody in the family is ill and needs so much care. That resentment builds up. It's not the person's fault. We know it's not the person's fault. But there, sometimes you just get angry. Sometimes somebody dies. You get so angry. The Jewish tradition understands the power of emotional pain and integrity of person that each of us is created in the image of God and we have a sacred integrity that no other person should violate 
And when it is violated, when we feel it is violated, there can, it creates distance and estrangement. And the thing that heals is ultimately a reconciliation that begins with one person saying, I'm sorry. And more than that, it's the other person saying, I forgive you. Being forgiving, letting go of anger, not letting pride get in the way. Letting go of anger is one of the greatest blessings we can give not only to the other, but to ourselves. We quote of often the great Rabbi Tversky's line, holding on to anger is like giving someone we don't like the opportunity to live inside us rent-free. No one should live inside anybody rent-free. We should only live inside each other when we are upbuilding and giving this tremendous sense of personhood and value and validation. Abraham is able to forgive God in, an, in an, a harrowing story. And God, God's self, is able to say, I will, forg I will become the forgiving God from this moment on. If Abraham can forgive, and if God, who is the symbol of what we want to be, can become the symbol of forgiveness, how much more should that be something that we embrace with our entire heart and being and soul? And that when we look at this symbol of blessing, one of the blessings we should see in that pure, clear water is the ability for us to be forgiving as much as is humanly possible in all our lives and all our relationships. May that be something else we hear as we read the Akedah on this Rosh Hashanah morning and we all say, We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.